Rod Oram, who's a business journalist with many years experience, both in New Zealand and London and New York and all over the place. Wonderful to have you, Rod. Um, Mike Taitoko, who is um, one of the co-founders of Toha and Calm the Farm, which is a new um, Regen Ag Farm Accelerator style program. Love to hear a bit more about that as we get into the call, Mike. Um, and we've got Jeff and Justine Ross, um, who are on Lake Hawia Station. And um, of course, are the uh, entrepreneurs behind 42 Below Vodka and uh, wrote a book about that and um, have really got into consumer brands and premium products for New Zealand and now turned their focus towards regenerative agriculture. Um, so wonderful to have you all on the panel this evening. Uh, we're also very lucky to have two EHF fellows. Uh, Rod and Mike are both EHF fellows in the Edmund Hillary Fellowship who are um, co-producers of this series along with Pure Advance. So I think at this stage, I'd love to hear uh, from some of our panelists. I'll ask you to um, just provide any background context and a bit of an introduction to yourselves, as well as telling us what regenerative agriculture means to you, because there are a lot of definitions out there. So curious to hear. Um, let's start with you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Alina. Kia ora koutou, uh, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou. Uh, ko Mike Taitoku taku ngā no mani poto ahau. Uh, firstly, thanks you to you, Alina, and Pure Advantage, Simon, and everyone for organising this hui uh, and the series, and kia ora Rod, um, fellow brother, uh, fellow EHF um, member, and um, also to um, Jeff and Justine, awesome to um, be part of this panel with you legends, so um, kia ora everyone. Um, my title, uh, I've uh, spent probably the last 20 years, best part of the last 20 years, working in the iwi and Māori economic development space. Um, and during that time, a lot of the work was involved around, you know, strategy and um, commercial stuff, which leans heavily into the primary industry space because that's where most of the assets are tied up. Uh, more recently, over the last five to seven years, uh, developed a digital analytics data platform uh, called Takiwa to uh, get much more uh, precise around what we're looking at with regard to strategy and investment decisions into the, uh, particularly into land use. Uh, and particularly the, uh, how we benefit from land use across our different asset classes, but also at the same time, how we make sure that we're discharging our roles as kaitiaki and making sure we're leaving a positive impact on the environment, papatūnuka, rather than a ne negative impact. Uh, more recently, that, some of that work led me into uh, partnering with Sean Hendy and Natalie Whitaker uh, to establish Toha, which is an impact investment platform. Uh, the kind of thesis behind all of that, uh, before, behind establishing Toha, was that the three of us, our collective experience of seeing that uh, we could see impact and uh, really impactful projects being driven at the front line, uh, real changes being made. We could also see a lot of failure and a lot of the times we, could, we couldn't see how the uh, investment, let alone scout investment, could get to the front line to help support that change. So we decided to um, have a crack at uh, building the impact investment platform called Toha and Calm the Farm became the first venture that we looked at to stand up. So we launched, soft launched that about uh, three, four months ago now. Uh, regenerative agriculture transition program looking to get scaled finance down to the front line uh, to help uh, fund the uh, transition both on farm but also for infrastructure and throughout the uh, value chain and supply chain. So. Um, and happy to be here and looking forward to the quarter. Kia ora. Oh, I'm sorry, I had, there was another question. Um, definition of regenerative agriculture. This is a really hot topic in uh, Aotearoa at the moment. I don't know why. Um, you know, we've got uh, technology at our fingertips now that basically means that if you want to know anything or learn anything, you can pretty much do it in a heartbeat, you know, within minutes, if not a day. Anyone who still doesn't understand what regenerative agriculture is and they want to know what it is, well, if they're asking the question, either aren't looking hard enough or don't want to know. Um, you know, we, it, it is a, it's a big, all-encompassing concept around um, nature and the conservation, preservation of nature, particularly as we carry out our farming businesses, on-farm businesses, horticulture, agriculture, arable, whatever it is. At the heart of it is, uh, it seems to be soil health seems to be right at the heart of that, and there's a lot to that above ground and below ground. But really, at the end of the day, um, I mean, for me, this if you want to know what it is, Google it. Have a, then jump onto Rodale Institute, gen, then jump onto Savory Institute, then jump onto Calm the Farm and other sites in New Zealand. Quorum Sense, there's some amazing sites out there. 
But the most important thing you can do is go and have a look at some of the farms and you'll know before you even get out of your car and sit in, in the paddocks, around the paddocks, you'll know what regenerative agriculture is. Wonderful. Very good points, Mike. Thank you. And we are excited to have somebody from Rodell actually joining us in a few weeks' time on one of our conversations um, that we're about to launch a, another six series after this. And so we've got uh, Jeff Tack from, uh, from Rodell joining us, which will be very exciting. Um, Rod, over to you. Uh, kia ora I was just unmuting myself there. Um, a real pleasure to be here and uh, thank you very much to Alina and to uh, Simon and Pure Advantage and um, uh, Mike and uh, wonderful to be on this with uh, Jeff and Justine as well. Uh, I'm a business journalist um, and I uh, carry quite a broad remit there. Um, I think business can be extremely useful for to driving positive change but of course business can also drive um, a, a astonishingly awful uh, outcomes. And um, as I think about the nature of business and how it fits in with society and the economy, it, it seems to me that the very essential element is this, that in everything we do, uh, whether it's in business, uh, whether it's in um, farming, whether it's in our personal lives, it's about working with nature and not against it, because that's the only way that we will stop um, depleting um, um, the natural systems of the, of the planet, the, the Earth systems. And we've actually got to turn those around so those Earth systems start to recover and um, so the planet is more resilient and more capable of being our life support system, which is what it is. And we're already at 7.8 billion people, um, a population that's trebled in my lifetime so far since I was born, and uh, probably heading towards 10 billion or so. So we need extremely healthy ecosystems. So we've got to stop doing all the bad stuff to them. So we give these ecosystems a chance to recover. And, and there will be positive things that we can do um, to help ecosystems recover. Um, but I want to stress there's um, a huge um, sort of life force in those ecosystems that once we take our sort of foot off the neck of nature, um, nature will do an awful lot of the repairing itself. So a very simple definition for, of regenerative agriculture for me is to make sure that when we farm, when we use land, we do so in ways that entirely works with nature and not against it. Now you can get into all kinds of definitions about um, the quality of the soil carbon you're building up or the level of biodiversity and all the rest. And that is important. And um, uh, it's probably really important at some point too that um, we have some robust standards by which people um, can measure themselves and then uh, market themselves uh, for meeting those. Um, but I want to uh, point out that this big push that seems to be coming from some quarters to somehow rege re define regenerative agriculture um, is, is really quite odd. Because if, for example, you go to the Dairy NZ website, um, uh, and that's, of course, there's the dairy industry funded uh, research organization. Um, a lot of their work is around organized around five farming systems. And um, they've got all sorts of profitability and environmental outcomes measured on those five systems. But the only difference between those five systems, um, there is only one metric in there, which is how much imported feed a farm uses. So at level one, there is zero imported feed and the farm is self-sufficient. And at system five, uh, which is pretty high intensity, there is approximately uh, between 25 and 40 plus percent of feed comes in from outside the farm. That's the only metric. So if Dairy New Zealand um, is not defining its farming systems that it analyzes more um, in more detail than that, um, I think that there's no need to um, be very prescriptive about a definition for regenerative agriculture. We just need to grasp the heart of it um, and then um, learn, that, learn about that and apply that um, the best we can. Mm, wonderful, Rod. Thank you. Justine and Jeff, I'll hand it over to you. Look, I'll go first. Um, I guess my lens um, is quite unique um, in this agricultural space. Fresh eyes on farming. Um, 
I have a background in consumer brands and um, documentary writing and researching, which I think documentaries are sort of the ultimate authentic form of storytelling. And look, what we're hearing and seeing um, are moves in popular culture. And um, uh, there's a macro trend um, of our time with consumers wanting to connect with the source of their food and fiber. And um, with that, they're saying that the source should be regeneratively farmed. So that's, that's our back, or my background, is, um, is to look at that and predict where it's going. And um, through my own um, journey, I've experienced what um, Malcolm Gladwell would call a cumulative set of advantages. Advantage one was a mother off a dairy farm. Advantage two was a grandfather who was a pioneer in the horticultural sector. And advantage three was that my father took me to live in the bush for a year when I was seven. So I then married this uh, farm boy who became a businessman. And uh, we went on an extraordinary journey. Um, and um, then I wrote a book about this global challenger brand that we built um, called Every Bastard Says No, which I'm sure the, um, the early adopter regen farmers could uh, relate to that title. And now that boy uh, that I married um, has bought a farm. And did I want uh, necessarily to be the custodian of 6.5 thousand hectares? Not immediately. Um, but that is my last cumulative advantage. It's that I bring fresh eyes uh, and, a, and a different perspective to the opportunity that I think we all have. And, um, and I'm not trying to please anyone in the sector. So I just ask questions every day on farm, especially around my pet topics, which are soil, um, keep it covered, I don't, you know, that's a big one for me. Um, and uh, mental health, uh, what, I've, what I've discovered in being on farm is that it, it is relentless. And um, the supporting farmers and, you know, Calm the Farm, Mike, is just extraordinary. Um, I'm so excited to see where that goes. Um, and the other thing is uh, animal welfare, big one for me. And I ask lots of amusing questions on farm regularly around that. Um, so I found that it's a sector that has um, almost as a reflex um, an instinct to sort of shame innovators um, and then it kind of opens up from there. And I've, and I've also discovered that sector stakeholders have a long way to go in the way that they support you on farm in terms of their own knowledge of the regenerative economy and the opportunities. Um, and I think that it's a really easy sell from a consumer brand perspective, healthier soil, clean uh, food, natural living, my fiber, my food, free of toxins and, and nutrient dense better for me. So an easy sell. The happenstance of my life is that I want this. I think consumers now want it and the planet needs it. And we're in this extraordinary position on this farm um, to be able to start to uh, um, make a difference. And um, my definition is very simple, uh, less in, more out. It's perfect, that captures it very well, less in, more out. Uh, wonderful. Let's, um, let's just briefly start with what the situation is right now um, for farmers that want to transition. There can be some costs associated with it. So we've had a question come in through the registration of what kind of typical costs you might see associated with the transition to regenerative. Um, any thoughts on that, Mike, given that you've spent a lot of time thinking about this? Um, yeah, I mean, well, we probably spent at least the last two and a half years navigating through this to see uh, both on both sides, conventional farming and then to regenerative and organ regenerative organics to see what this transition cost in time and energy looks like. Um, and I mean, there's, there's, there's more than just on farm transition as well. We're talking about uh, if we're going to build a sector around regenerative agriculture, regenerative organics, it's almost end to end right throughout the value chain, through supply chains and distribution and beyond to consumers. So, um, that, but from an on farm perspective, um, it really de depends on the kind of methodology. So one of the challenges with defining re regenerative agriculture is you get these 
kind of this continuum of change from you know uh, regenerative people who uh, farmers who say they're doing regenerative agriculture but still need to use some chemicals and that you see that mostly in the um, on the cropping side of things don't see it so much in dairy down to the other end where regenerative organics farmers are um, getting the chemicals off and synthetic nitrogen and everything else off and really focusing on soil health and you know, animal health and everything else that goes with it. Um, we're seeing farmers right now with the right support getting through the transition, funding that out of business as usual um, costs, so uh, budgets. So what they were spending last year running a conventional model, they can um, pretty much run the same budget through the transition and come out the other side. Uh, in, in, in pretty good shape, not to, um, and that's um, not even in, um, talking about, starting to talk about the resilience that they've started to build back into the farm and business model. Um, and then you get the um, massive challenge we've got with succession and, um, you know, the baby boomers, you know, needing to move off farm soon and sell up and, you know, we've got massive challenges there and, and, and most people know what, the, what that looks like. So there's an opportunity for investors, other farmers. You know, we've got farmers right now who want to buy the farm next door. They've been doing regen for two, three, five years and have seen how they can improve the resilience of the farm again in the business model. And so already have confidence to buy the farm next door. So looking for ways to fund that, whether it's through um, more debt or um, joint venture partners or whatever. Uh, and then you've got um, other farmers right now who are um, who are talking to us about uh, wanting to build processing um, capability on farm, and so you have a different type of investment need there and a different type of investor model. So there's a, a huge range um, of investor needs invest, uh, by the farmers and throughout the um, supply chain, uh, and it's a conversation that you could spend a week having. And uh, as you unpack it, it, it's complex, but it's exciting and it's incredibly doable. Um, so. Yeah, we could talk about that one all day. Thanks, Mike. Um, I'd like to also put that question to Jeff. Uh, but before you do answer that, we'd love to actually ask you um, and invite you to introduce yourself um, as we as we skipped you. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Kia ora kato, Jeff Takuino. Um, thank you all. Kia ora, Mike. Kia ora, Rod. Look, uh, as Jesse said, I guess our viewpoint comes from two, two lenses. One is uh, from consumer brands. And as Jesse said, we're starting to hear more and more from customers and consumers around the world um, that there is a demand for regenerative source um, products, food and fibre. And secondly, our, our, um, our relatively recent um, acquisition and return to farming after many, many years. Um, look, as Mike said, I don't think there's going to be a clear definition to regenerative agriculture as much as we'd love to have one. Uh, coming from the brand world, the world, the word brand has existed for probably 60 years, but I don't think anyone's got a clear definition of that yet. Neither do they of digital marketing, for instance, to use another more recent um, analogy. So regenerative really is, for me, um, and perhaps in hindsight, if we had been involved, we would have called it something different, but that horse is truly bolted. Uh, so let's not try and argue with uh, the reinvention of a language or a term. Let's go with it. In fact, I think New Zealand has an opportunity to lead it. We've got a wee bit of catching up to do, but we can lead this one. So look, my definition really is about diversity of pasture. So if you've got more plants in the ground, your animal health should be better because your sheep and cattle in our instance are choosing rather from two or three plants, they're choosing from 20. So that should, should mean healthier livestock. Should certainly mean healthier soil um, because rather than two or three root types in your soil, you've got more than 20 and that's going to create greater transfer of nutrients through the soil, better bacteria, better fungi. And I'm not going to go into that because this, this shows had far better panelists on, on that topic. Um, look, as Jesse said, it should, it should also mean less and more out. Um, from what we've seen in our brief trials, from what we're hearing, um, that seems certainly true. And the last and the, probably the biggest really is that soil is probably the unsung hero in sequestering carbon, right? So healthy soils have a heap more organic matter in them. Um, as I've pretty recently learned, that organic matter is full of carbon. So the healthier soil, the more carbon in the soil, the better for the planet. So my definition is just more diversity. It's going to help us on farm. It's going to help the planet. Mm, fantastic. Um, that's a great point you've got there around um, 
around soil carbon being uh, pretty new in terms of our thinking around sequestering carbon. Um, Rod, I wonder if you've got any thoughts around um, uh, the possibility for some sort of a carbon market that can, um, that can work around soil sequestration, um, as we have with the emissions trading scheme and, and trees and so on. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, the, obviously, the key to that is being able to um, measure soil carbon accurately, and a lot of work's going into that. There's obviously a, um, a big pushback on that idea because people are saying a number of things. First of all, um, that soil carbon can be quite variable um, through the years, through the seasons, um, and thus we need to find a way to um, sort of smooth that out, uh, hopefully naturally in terms of the soil being more stable, um, but uh, also in the measurement. Um, but there's also another uh, pushback coming from people saying, well, in New Zealand, we've already got in many places um, pretty high levels of soil carbon. Um, but I think that's um, a very uh, relative and misleading number uh, because it's relative to the rest of the country. Um, it's relative to depleted soils um, in many other places in the world. It's not, as it should be, relative to the huge potential that's there. Um, and of course, I'm extremely excited about um, soil carbon, not just for all the farming benefits, uh, but because of the enormous opportunity uh, to be um, pulling more carbon out of the um, atmosphere and thus uh, reducing our parts per um, million up there um, and thus um, easing the pressure up on climate change. Um, and so I'd love to see farming, you know, deeply integrated into that whole system. So um, lots to work on. Um, and um, I, I think th those opportunities are starting to um, uh, become more widely discussed. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it strikes me that we, we haven't uh, funded and done a lot of the science that's needed in New Zealand to actually um, start uh, making the government or, or the industry leaders uh, more comfortable with backing Regen Ag. Um, any, um, any thoughts, Mike, around how what Takiwa is doing can help support the case? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think... Um one of the biggest barriers we've got right now to uh, really getting traction with Regen Ag in New Zealand is it goes back to that definition, but it also goes back to the uh, inertia that the conventional uh, farming sector has in New Zealand. And I mean, that's not a criticism, it's, it is what it is. And so the infrastructure, whether it's um, the physical infrastructure or the financing infrastructure to fund the growth of the sector and um, over, the, over decades has been built to support a particular way of farming. And so the headwinds we get right now are quite natural, and that is, you know, re regenerative agriculture is, you know, what does it mean, and, and how do we know it's going to be better than what we're currently doing? And there's this whole narrative around um, that creates the headwinds that really make it hard for government, for the agencies to support the sorts of fun, um, science we need um, to start to break through this. Now, we know that there's been some reasonable uh, bids made into government, into the agencies for science funding to be um, provided into regenerative agriculture and they um, they really struggle. Well, they don't get across the line at the end of the day. The, any proposals around regen ag have, um, have failed to get across the line over the last few years. And so, um, you know, and I think that's a lot of that has got to do with the criteria that you have to, the threshold you have to meet around science excellence to show, you know, what is this kind of natural biological thing you're talking about? We want to do real science. And so I think that's uh, created a huge barrier to, um, to the change. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're about to kind of cut through that. There's enough in, uh, momentum coming out of groups like Aotearoa Circle. Uh, I think MPI have just commissioned a piece of work just recently, Sam Lang and Gwen Grillet are carrying out that bit of work. So I think we're seeing these, the windows just slowly cracking open, but we actually need to bust it open pretty quickly to get a New Zealand context. But from a science perspective, I mean, it doesn't take much to find out what the peer reviewed um, published work globally around soil carbon sequestration and regenerative agriculture and the impacts of that on uh, climate and fresh water and healthy food systems and health population. I mean, there's no, sh it's, just, it's out there. So we just need to look a bit harder for it and we'll find it. Could I yes. add another thought? Absolutely. I think there's um, a strange um, 
psychology going on uh, because on one hand um, New Zealand farming systems over the last 30 years um, have been um, genuinely innovative and a um, very interesting piece of work out of our land and water uh, national science challenge is that the innovation cycle here in agriculture is literally twice as fast as the United States um, but it's still very slow it takes almost two decades um, for a proven piece of a big step in science and technology to become uh, ubiquitous in the farming system. But what I found strange over the last few years is that um, the, um, the farming seems to have lost its mojo a bit um, in terms of that confidence in being able to innovate. And um, I, I can understand some of the financial pressures because the dairy sector in particular has completely um, overcooked its business model, um, uh, at least the intensive farmers have, uh, and there's very high debt levels now in the dairy sector overall. Um, but there's also a sense that um, uh, among some farmers that they're being um, sort of dumped on uh, by the rest of society. And um, what I've come across only secondhand, and I'd be interested in Mike and Jeff and Justine, if you've come across this directly, about farmers apparently um, who um, don't like the term regenerative because it, they feel that it's disparaging about what they're already doing uh, or what they've been doing for a long time. And I think that's the wrong way of looking at it. At any one time, we do by and large the best we can we know about. And it's perfectly all right to say, well, look, we thought that was best, but now we're moving on. And I think just to sort of to try to encourage farmers um, and scientists to go, well, actually, the, there's this whole debate globally about land use and food and farming. Um, let's be part of that debate. And a really central part of that reject debate is about rebuilding ecosystems. And, and so I, I think we need to be very positive in those sorts of messages. Rod, can I jump in and, and, and just say exactly that? So I've spoken to a lot of farmers about the term regenerative and there's, there's kind of this defensive view to work towards it because most farmers are saying, hang on a minute, we're, we're already regenerative. Our pastures regenerate from one year to another. And, and uh, the term regenerative apparently came from the US where crops like soybeans were put in the ground, they're sprayed to buggery, fertilized to buggery, harvested, then they're sprayed again, everything killed off, and then a new crop would start, right? So there's no regeneration, there's no diversity, no soil health, all those types of things. Whereas in New Zealand, most of our grasses, like, you know, rye grasses, clovers, et cetera, do regenerate from year to year. So that's why there's this defensive view towards it. And that's why uh, there's a search for a definition because most farmers are saying, hang on, I'm not sure about this bloody new term. What I'm suggesting is just forget the term for a moment. It is what it is, that horse is bolted. Let New Zealand agriculture do what typically it's always done, which is be a leader, um, grab it, understand that the more diversity in, in, in our pasture, the more diversity in our soil is gonna be better for, for all of us, better for our livestock, better for soil health, less, import, less inputs. If we can kind of start understanding those principles, we don't need to put a formula to it as much as some would love to, and every farm's different, so there's never gonna be a, one formula that suits all. If we can kind of embellish, come up with our own view on it, put it on our own farm, start developing it, and then start profiling it, I think we can can come out of this really well. And as Jesse said, we can start talking to a growing consumer base and ideally earn a premium for it without any further inputs or investment. Uh, Lena, uh, oh, sorry, Jesse. I just wanted to, uh, I think that it would be useful to hear um, the the net Jeff keeps saying the horse is bolted. We're dealing with the name Regen, and it's a stumbling block. And Mike, you said it is from an investor interest perspective, and there's it uh, creates some negative energy. Farmers are struggling with it for the reason Jeff just outlined, and Rod's pointed that out. There was the name that you came up with. Um, we'll call it diverse, diverse pastures or more diversity, you know, so, but that's a new language. I'm not suggesting that, but that's kind of what it is to me at least. Right. 
so so the the thing is that we're just getting hung up on it and and as Jeff said we've just got to move on and and create our own narrative around it and then tell that story um, over and over and over again what does it mean for us in New Zealand and I think there's a lot of merit in that uh, although um, the, the danger we would face is that the word regenerative uh, now has very wide um, use and understanding. So for example, just last week, Unilever, uh, one of the world's largest food processors, announced a billion euro climate and nature fund is the title. Um, and at the same time announced that um, all of its suppliers uh, would need to meet a regenerative agricultural code. And that's the term um, it, on their journey to being net zero on products um, by 2039. So uh, to me, it's, it's like the word sustainability or, or a better example is democracy. We kind of roughly know what we think democracy might look like, but nobody ever tries to define it to death. And um, so I, I think we should just sort of lean into it and certainly bring a lot of um, New Zealand um, style and language and indigenous knowledge to it so we can own it in our own way, um, but not shy away from use, uh, aligning with the global term. Yes, yeah, so exactly. just a oh, sorry, quick point, Mike. When Vogue magazine start having articles right. that say why regenerative agriculture can save the world, I think we've We've got to accept that that term is bolted, and uh, you know what. What the better headline is to follow up that uh, that headline is is why New Zealand is leading regenerative agriculture. Whether we like the term or not, let's lead it, and uh, and and we've got a bloody great head start thanks to a lot of our existing pasture practices. Absolutely, Mike. Did you have a comment that there? I was just going to add on to all of that. Um, uh, what we've been doing with Calm the Farmers, working with the farmers and advisors in the region ag space over the last couple of years to help us work through an um, indicator set and a framework for measuring and tracking the change. And there's really two sides of that coin. One is um, what are the things that the farmers are doing, the inputs, the actions, the activities that they're carrying out, and what's coming out the other side in terms of outputs, productivity, and results, so outcomes. And we've got quite a broad uh, and diverse uh, set of indicators and data, and it needs to be diverse until we can start to work out what good looks like, what does excellent look like in the space. Mm. And, um, and so through that, over time, and with that data coming through from the farms, the two sides of that coin, what it looks like is you've got the um, environmental impacts and sort of the climate-related stuff like soil carbon, soil carbon se and uh, sequestration and uh, freshwater impacts. On the other side, you've got the economic and the productivity benefits or outcomes. And so already we're seeing that by starting to minimize and mitigate your environmental risk and footprint, i.e. Uh, get, get the synthetic nitrogen off, you know, in year one, just get it, get, get it down to zero from say, you know, 40 to 90 tons a year going on your farm. Um, we're seeing farmers get that down to zero at the same time as they go through and we're tracking the results. The productivity is looking just, it's remarkable what's happening. And so the, um, you know, a lot of the stuff goes to bottom line and these, uh, and, and we're seeing some, uh, like I said, remarkable um, financial results come out the other side. Now, there's still a long way to go to get the volume of data and information through and over time we can narrow that data set down. But I think uh, it won't take long, maybe 12 to 18 months and we're going to have an awesome New Zealand specific and contextual data set and evidence that uh, we can lead the way and this is how you do it. And it's not going to be the scientists and the geeks like the data geeks like me or the journalists like Rod. It's going to be the farmers like Jeff and Justine that tell us how it's done. Mm -hmm. And the more we can start to listen and understand and not judge what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it, the faster we're going to learn why there's upside in this thing and how, and how we uh, set about changing the game, not just farm by farm, but for the country. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you raise an interesting point in there in that um, re regenerative isn't, isn't a goal, an end goal where you get to. It's something that you are continuously doing and looking at and observing the land um, and trying out different things. Um, I'd like to actually uh, ask a question from a farmer now. I'm going to combine two questions into one. We've got a question from Hamish Bielsk. Um, around, uh, oh, it's just disappeared, sorry, um, around finding uh, investors who could be keen to put money on a farm um, and a business that are using regenerative management principles. Um, and then there's also a question from Trevor around 
uh, developing a, a region ag farm sharing model where older investors can partner with young farmers. Um, is that something you can speak to, Mike? Oh, yeah, oh, kia ora, Hamish. Um, and sorry, I missed the second person's name. Trevor. Trevor. Um, well, I mean, awesome question. So we've been working on um, just building up the, the platform and the, and the framework for bringing investors together with the farmers, um, depending on what the investor needs are and the farmer needs. So you've basically got two stacks. You've got the stack of needs that farmers are looking for. So is it support to transition through year one and underwrite a bit of the risk? Um, are we going to need to bring more feed in if we get a climate event or you know, are we going to, do we need to put uh, new fencing or new troughs or more paddocks in? Because if you increase your rotation rate from, if you're dairy farming, you're increasing, Kia Hamish, reducing your, uh, increasing your rotation rate from you know, 15 to 20 days up to 30 to 50 days, you, there's a high likelihood you're going to need new farm infrastructure. All the way through, as we said earlier, through to buying farms or buying, you know, pool, pooling with others to buy farms. Um, so you've got all these needs for farm that, that farmers are looking for, including you know processing capability and, and stainless steel infrastructure. I see one of the questions there. On the investor side, you've got uh, all the way from you know what local governments are prepared to invest in regional councils in order to mitigate out and start to invest in some of the environmental mitigating strategies like WGNA if we can prove it, uh, up to um, uh, philanthropies and impact investors who might want little or no return on their money but are prepared to put it into things that we can prove will make a difference all the way up to um, you know uh, well, and banks who are prepared to put debt into this area into the space without penalizing the father, farmers but rewarding them because we can prove it's a bit more bankable model and all the way up to private equity and capital markets and so you've got these two stacks so the answer to Hamish I think is absolutely um, opportunities to match uh, investors with farmers right now uh, and but there's a bit of a process to go through to look at what those needs are on both sides across the stack. And to Trevor's question, um, farm shares got to be, I think, it's one of the a, a, an obvious and also a simple solution to starting to uh, minimize the infrastructure costs and capital costs we need as we grow into um, expand as we look at expanding. So, and there's some really good platforms and, and uh, examples of where that's working well. And we've been talking to one of the outfits in the US that are doing an amazing job with um, with sharing infrastructure, but also bringing young ones through onto the farm and sharing in the equity and upside of the, um, the, the investment into the farm itself. So there's lots of different ways of doing this. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Um, and I'd like to come in a minute to uh, Jeff and Justine with a question around um, consumer um, driven trends. But uh, just qu a quick question while we're with you, Mike, around what kind of investments are underway and planned that are directed towards uh, existing Marakaya initiatives or iwi and hapu-led community gardens um, that have goals beyond just commercial success. Um, I, f I don't want to hog the oxygen from the panel because I mean these guys are legends and so very quickly look I think it's there's some uh, Ngai Tahu have been doing some awesome Marakaya projects um, around their marae. Uh, it's definitely post-COVID during and uh, post-COVID is a massive um, the corridor has has gone up tenfold around uh, planting the gardens and providing food to your local whanau and communities around the marae and around the communities. Uh, and so from a region ag perspective, uh, there's definitely opportunities to say, how do we invest in the kind of capability building and infrastructure that needs to go into helping build a sustainable marakai um, industry from a iwi Māori whanau community and hapu community perspective, but for all our communities, there's definitely a chance to invest in shorter supply chains and growing those foods, you know, the food closer to home, if not at home. Um, so it's an awesome question and it's a really timely one and there's some cool stuff happening, but we need much more of it to happen. Mm. Uh, if we're gonna ride out the next uh, wave, the next pandemic, um, a matter of if not um, when. Indeed. When, um, a question come through on the Pure Advantage Instagram. Um, how can consumers in New Zealand support Regen Ag through investment? So how do, how do consumers vote with their wallets? I think, um, look, the most important thing that they can do is, um, is, is buy the products um, and, and develop an awareness of um, where the fibre and the meat is, is, is going. And, um, you know, uh, you've got 
people like Maggie Marilyn, for example, an extraordinary New Zealand designer who has a, now an amazing circular line, which is all about sustainability. And um, there are just uh, amazing New Zealand brands and innovators out there who are actually on farm are looking to diversify by creating their own products. So it's really um, building an awareness and, and voting with their wallet for those, for those innovators. Um, and if I, if I just could, um, uh, I'd just like to respond to a question, if that's all right, um, from Louise, um, who says that the third part of the environment and economy sphere and region is social and that mental health of farmers and rural communities is an integral part of region ag. And look, here on the farm, for us, we can really see the strain and that's in a, in a very well supported uh, community of people. Um, it's uh, definitely the single largest undertaking of our lifetime and I have a huge amount of empathy now for the incredible pressure that farmers um, throughout our country are under and I, uh, I, I really want to support that question and thank you for it Louise and I think also that farmers like ourselves have to uh, reach out into the community as well and support our local communities as, as best we can. Thank you for that very, very good point, very good point Justine, thank you. Um, and for those who want to dive a little more into that topic, we uh, had a conversation two weeks ago with John O'Fru, Sam Lang and Jules Matthews um, about community and mental health and those elements of regenerative agriculture. Super important conversation for our rural communities. Rod, I want to ask you what you think the role of government could be. Um, I'm a, would certainly setting frameworks um, and supporting in various ways, but I'm, I'm very, very cautious. Uh, in fact, I'm very opposed to the idea that uh, we should be looking to the government um, to be uh, pushing this in some way. And the government needs to respond to a great sort of grassroots, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, a, a demand for this. Um, and I'll give you a couple of uh, examples of why uh, government isn't particularly helpful. So for example, uh, we've had a sustainable farming fund now from the government for 18 years. And in the first 17 years, it funded a thousand projects, but only to the tune of $150 million. Um, so in other words, um, here in New Zealand, uh, government is notoriously, um, bad, it's notoriously good at um, uh, handing out micro sums to multiple projects. Um, and that um, is, uh, uh, there's other mechanisms for that, like crowdfunding and the sort of work that Mike's doing. Government shouldn't be funding at that kind of level. Um, but, um, uh, but in terms of uh, trying to um, facilitate the shift, absolutely. But, it, um, but I come back to the biggest help that um, I think government could be, would be to push um, in a very constructive way um, for the work that um, is going on uh, in um, the, the five-year uh, work program that's underway, uh, which is a joint um, initiative of the primary sector and government, um, Hewaka Ekanoa, um, to work out how to um, measure um, um, greenhouse gas emissions on farm and manage them and then price them. And, and I'd love to see that work um, extended to, uh, to soil carbon um, and to um, other ways in which um, um, carbon is sequestered on farm. Um, because I think the, those pricing um, incentives uh, would then be very valuable to farmers. The next thing is um, Dairy New Zealand, and I'm picking up here on a, on a suggestion from Jeff in our Q&A panel. Um, Dairy New Zealand is funded by uh, a mandatory levy on dairy farmers um, and there is a board that decides how that money is then spent and so it's entirely um, appropriate um, that those dairy farmers um, persuade the board and thus the management of Dairy NZ to shift some funds into um, uh, the science for um, re regenerative farming. And then um, when we look beyond that, um, Greenpeace was very helpful um, about six weeks ago by um, s uh, proposing a billion dollar a regenerative farming fund. I, I had caution uh, in my own mind about some aspects of it. So there would be funding for um, 
uh, fencing waterways, for example. Well, I, that's I think that's straying a bit too far from uh, principles of regenerative agriculture and that fencing is going on anyway. But there was a lot of sense in that report, uh, both about the science of regenerative agriculture, um, but also a big um, funding measure. Um, and then for me, another big hope, um, and um, Mike already touched on this, is the Aotearoa Circle, which is a combination of business and government leaders uh, putting natural capital uh, right at the heart of what we do. So two important thrusts of the Aotearoa Circle is the Sustainable Finance Forum, which will be producing its final report um, late this year um, and made very good progress in its interim report last year. Um, but then uh, the work it's doing on futures that just came to its first level of fruition last week. Um, and one of the three um, focuses there is on a productive, sustainable and inclusive food system um, where um, the absolute driver of this um, is regenerative agriculture. So I think um, that's a, a very, very interesting combination of business leaders um, and um, government leaders um, that might um, get us some traction um, on this. And particularly if it's um, dovetails uh, with the work of the Sustainable Finance Forum, which mission is to green finance, I don't like this phrase, but to green finance and to finance green. Uh, and, um, but I think that will be a good way to get at money. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's great to hear that, that those kind of conversations are going on in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I heard an alarming um, suggestion from Christiana Figueres on a, I think it was an RNZ webinar where she said, you know, if we are going to uh, invest in decarbonisation, uh, we don't have the 10 years that we thought this pandemic has meant that all the money is going to be spent within, or at least committed within the next uh, three to 18 months which is, is quite terrifying in, in terms of thinking about um, coming up with those sorts of solutions to decarbonize now. Um, it perhaps is a, a role for Regen Ag um, to play in that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay, uh, there is a question here um, that I'd like to put to Justine and Jeff um, uh, from Mark Anderson. Um, great work in amazing landscapes on Lake Hauia Station. Um, carbon neutral uh, is, is a large claim to be making. So how are you verifying these claims at the early stage, um, mainly regarding building soil carbon and creating a circular regenerative system? So the, the carbon neutral piece, uh, we've used a couple of calculators which are pretty um, kind of back of the envelope type things. Uh, Trees that count have one, uh, beef and lamb have one. So you basically put in your stock numbers, your type of farming system, that'll give you your total emissions profile. Um, and then you, you add in what your, your vegetation looks like. You know, it might be exotic forest. It might be some regenerating um, native forest. Um, and it comes up with a bit of a ledger, how much you're admitting, how, admitting how much you use sequestering. And we've now taken that a little further and working with a, a company called um, Advice who have done that uh, far more scientifically. So that's, that's where we are. The, the, um, where some science could help is looking at regenerative because there's no, I think we talked about this at the start of this um, webinar, there's, there's no um, measure as yet for what soil is doing. Um, there's some beliefs that soil um, is a fantastic sequester and you only need to put your spade into some heavy organic matter and a healthy soil to kind of believe that. There's also some understanding that tussock, and, which is a big part of our um, high country station, tussock, snow tussock is a great sequester, but as yet that's out of the calculation um, uh, math that we're using. Uh, I'd love to see it in, it would make our position uh, a little better again. Yeah, fantastic. Um, still a lot of the a lot of the work to be done there, and it's great to hear that um, the likes of uh, Gwen Grillet and and Sam Lang have have got that that research and developing a white paper. Um, very good. Um, we've got just a few more minutes here, so I've got time to take a couple more questions. Um, if you've got any, you want to get into the Q and A box. Uh, we also will be. Um, looking to answer some of these questions live on social media um, in the coming week because we're not going to be able to get to everything. Um, 
Hamish has got an interesting comment there about uh, methane from ruminants, also very hard to measure, but that hasn't stopped them taking it into account. So really interesting comment there that um, just because something is hard to measure doesn't mean we should, we should be doing it. Um, I want to just present the fact that we are in a not a very normal um, position in the world right now in that um, we've very much uh, seen just the beginning of, of what the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what the effects of, um, of, of how that's looking on our economy. Um, curious to hear from any of you if you think uh, this pandemic has uh, accelerated a need for Regen Ag or if it's presented new opportunities that perhaps we didn't have before. Uh, Rod, any thoughts on that? Um, I'm really wrestling with that one because uh, overall, in terms of trying to um, get a sense of how much our, our views and our desires really have changed uh, now that we're getting back to some semblance of normal. Um, um, but I still think there's a, um, people have sort of glimpsed enough during lockdown here in New Zealand um, to, uh, to be reminded rapidly um, that the, um, the sort of benefits, ecosystem benefits that we're talking about here um, from regenerative agriculture uh, will give us um, some of those things that, that, um, that, that we desire. Um, one of the curious ones has been um, the real problem with meat processing plants, um, particularly in the United States with high level of COVID um, cases. Um, and some people have been saying, well, look, that's a perfect um, example of why we need to have plant-based foods or cellular agriculture, you know, growing things from stem cells. Um, I think that's misplaced because um, our um, abattoirs here have been able to function uh, very well without uh, causing um, illness amongst their um, people. So I think that's misplaced. Um, but if we keep tying back um, the twin desires of uh, better human health, from what we eat and better planetary health from how we farm. And, and that takes us right back to the Eat Lancet Commission um, 18 months ago and other work. Um, I think we can um, really get people quite excited about this. And I want to make sort of one last point about our opportunity in New Zealand. Um, uh, there's increasing competition from plant-based uh, foods uh, or plant-based milks and, and all the rest, and also um, cellular agriculture. But those can only drive down um, uh, the negative impact on ecosystems um, to zero or you know, some plant-based could be positive. Um, but we've got a real opportunity with our pastoral farming here um, to go beyond negative to um, very positive attributes. Uh, and so ruminant animals and the way they graze are really important um, for building up soil carbon, for example, um, and um, hence the great savannas and prairies in the past. So I, I think that if we um, understand that in farming this way, we can go on to a trajectory of increasing positive benefits um, and then bring in um, our very distinctive flora and fauna and landscapes and everything else here in New Zealand. I think we've got a terrific thing um, to be able to um, offer um, consumers. Mm, okay, we've got a few minutes left here. So I'd love to just uh, give the, each of our panelists the opportunity uh, for any final words or thoughts that you'd like to um, get out there about a minute each, I think we'll have, or, or 45 seconds each. Let's go with that, Mike. Um, thanks, Alina. Uh, just to build on what Rod was saying, I think, you know, COVID is just a drop in the bucket compared to what's facing us with the existential, existential threat that climate change is bringing. If we're worried about the economic impacts of COVID, uh, COVID we've already seen the impact, e e economic and environmental impacts that climate's having on us right now. It's only going to get worse. And so COVID for me is like, this is the, just the tip of the iceberg that says, guys, pay attention. There's a reason we've gone down this rabbit hole of COVID. We've created the food systems and the industrialized systems. We've created the industrialized education systems to make us think the way we think right now, which is why we argue over the definition of Regen Ag rather than use our senses and our senses to work out for ourselves what it is. We have to wait for someone to give us the answers rather than working out for ourselves. And so uh, I see regenerative agriculture, I'm quite passionate about this because of the research our science team has done on this and our business analytics and other whole bunch of other domains um, as 
the probably the biggest opportunity we have right in front of us right now to turn this kind of train wreck around. Uh, and you know, we'll do the best we can with the time we've got to um, to to make a positive difference. So, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, Mike. Jeff and Justine, any final words? To say that we don't just need um, 10 or 20% or of farmers to come with us on this. We need 95% to, uh, to see that for the good of the planet and, um, and, and for profit, for the health of our animals, uh, for, the, for the good of our communities. That there are so many important reasons. And you know, many of us during lockdown were privileged to, um, to be involved in the magic of Zoom and to hear directly from the clients we supply that they themselves want us to be walking the regenerative path. So the demand is there from all over the world from our clients that we supply. So we all need to lean into this opportunity for all of those reasons, for our country and for the planet and, um, and, and to tell a great story along the way. And um, I'm, I'm excited to, to, for spring. <laughs> Jeff, did you want to add anything? No, I think that's a great summary. Thanks, Selena. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Oh, thank you for thank you for joining us, Rod. Over to you for any final thoughts. Yes, I would just like to add urban farmers into this. Um, so um, uh, you could apply regenerative farming practices in your garden, um, or um, in a a, a, a food growing small plot in the city, or it'd be really exciting to see those cattle grazing on on Mongakiki, a uh, One Tree Hill, uh, grazing regeneratively. Um, and indeed, uh, Steward, which is a very um, interesting uh, US funder of regen regenerative agriculture, um, uh, supports micro farmers in Detroit. And I just think it'd be tremendously exciting, uh, first of all, to get more people growing food in their towns and cities, um, but doing so in a regenerative way so they can relate far better um, to um, those people who are doing the really hard yards um, out um, in um, on the sides of mountains or, or in other more hostile environments. Wonderful point, Rod, and that's a, a lovely point to end on. Um, as I tell you just a little bit about our uh, next upcoming webinars. Thank you all again for joining us. It's been a fantastic conversation. So many questions coming through. And as I said, Pure Advantage will be addressing some of those on the social media, on Instagram and Facebook. So keep an eye on there. Uh, this recording will be available on the Pure Advantage uh, website, uh, pureadvantage.org, as well as the Edmund Hillary Fellowship YouTube channel. So we've got um, an exciting new series of, of webinars to announce um, in the coming six Mondays. Um, we've just been, had so much great momentum around this series that um, we feel compelled to continue the conversation. Um, so Ursula's put a slide up here where you can learn a little bit about what's coming up in the future. Um, next week we've got a conversation around what is regenerative organic. Um, so that is, um, that's a conversation that's uh, been happening a lot over in the United States where they've got a voluntary standard around it. We've got Robin O'Brien, Scott Lawson and uh, Jeff uh, Tekak from the Rodale Institute there. So that'll be a really exciting conversation. Um, building farm resilience with Greg Hart and Gary Williams. I know there was a, co a question that came through the chat today around the farmers up in the Hawke's Bay in the drought. So Greg Hart has um, got a, a regenerative farm up in the Hawke's Bay and we'll be able to speak a little bit to that. Uh, we are expanding a little bit beyond just the regenerative agriculture remit with this series into other forms of regenerative economy. So we've got regenerative forestry coming up um, in three weeks time. Um, very honored to have Dame Ann Salmond on there, um, as well as um, uh, Dr. Dave Hall. Um, urban regenerative agriculture, as Rod has just mentioned, is certainly going to be a big part of it. It doesn't have to all be on the, the rural farmers. There's certainly a part that city dwellers can play. So we've got um, Sheldon Levitt from Kai Cycle here in Wellington, Sarah Smuts-Kennedy um, up in Auckland, and Bailey Perriman um, from Cultivate Christchurch. Uh, so that'll give us a good sense of what's going on across the country. 
uh, regenerative tourism after that with Trent Yeo and uh, Dr. Suzanne Beckham from over in Australia. And then a final episode on uh, really tying everything up towards a regenerative economy in New Zealand. So lots of great conversations happening in the uh, coming six weeks. Um, Details on each of these will be coming out to you, I think, from Pure Advantage's mailing list and on um, all the social channels across EHF and Pure Advantage. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much for joining us again. Um, ka kite. Have a wonderful evening. Okay, nice. See you.